I'm live on LinkedIn. I'm thrilled to be back together with my good friend and client, Andrew Bush. Welcome, Andy. Yeah, it's great to be here, Jane. Thanks for having me on. Ah. Now, today we're talking about what to expect with the Delta variant, how you as a speaker can prepare. But before we get to that, Andy, tell everybody, like, why do you know so much about this stuff? Like, huh? <laughs> You're an economist, right? So let's start there, but work us through to uh, pandemics. <laughs> sure. So, um, <laughs> you know, you, you'd think, well, why would an economist know this? I mean, obviously, we know it now because of what happened since the onset of COVID back in the beginning of 2020. But actually, this all, all this process started uh, almost 14 years ago for me, because as I was looking at the markets, as I was looking at the economy back in the early 2000s, you know, there were things like SARS and bird flu that they were major events that were going on around the world that were impacting both the economy and the markets. So I thought it was a great idea to write a book called World Event Trading. And the first five chapters are on infectious disease outbreak and their impact on the markets and the economy, what sectors of the economy are impacted, what businesses are impacted, what do the markets look at, uh, the duration of it. And so when I saw COVID happening or beginning to happen, mm -hmm. um, it was like, okay, I've seen this before. I, I have a pretty good idea what the initial phases will look like. Yeah. But of course, I don't think anybody had it going on as long as it is. But historically, I mean, this is like, you, all you have to do is go back to 1918, 1919 with the right. Spanish flu. It went on for two years. So yeah. that's what we're looking at right now. And certainly that's playing out. Okay. So say the name of the book again. World event trading. World event training, trading. Okay. Yeah. So just want to make sure that if people are listening in, they're like, okay, what's this book? I'm very curious. Uh, go out and get that book. Now, if you are tuning in on LinkedIn or Facebook or YouTube, we'd love to know that you are listening. So say hello in the comments box. Let us know where you live and stay tuned for when we open up for questions because we would love to hear some questions from the audience. Of course, we never know how many people are listening. If anybody's listening and maybe that you're watching the video later, we are not in control of that. So hopefully we'll get a few people tuning in. It would be nice to know. Okay. So you told me this thing a few weeks ago that we'll be going from pandemic to endemic to flu. What the heck is an endemic? please. <laughs> I've been wondering that ever since, really. <laughs> right. Well, what it means is that when you have pandemic, it means it's an outbreak that goes across the world, right? Okay. Endemic is usually the next stage to some extent where it's not just in some countries, it's everywhere and always with you. And oh. that's the process by which we're in right now. Because what are we seeing? Um, it, and, and the transition is from endemic to flu. And that's what, fingers crossed, I always say, that's where we're going. Meaning we're seeing, the Del we're seeing variants of the original COVID virus happen because it's a virus and it's genetically unstable. So it mutates. And that's what we're seeing, just like what happened in 1918 and 1919. And so... Um, what we're seeing now is it's becoming so prevalent across the world that people are adjusting their lives. They're getting used to it. Um, a great example of this is what's been going on um, here in the United States to some extent and, and more in the UK, where it is really just becoming part of what people deal with on a daily basis. Right. And so the world doesn't shut down again like it did in 2020. We've adjusted. We know what the problems are. We, we realize the risks. We see people getting sick. We have vaccinations, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. We have tools to help mitigate it, masks and things like that. Right. So that's where I think we're going. And eventually, let's, let's really hope that we'll see this again mutate you know, out of Delta into a new variant that is more contagious, but less virulent, where it won't kill as many people. Right. And then- probably will morph again. And then it just becomes like a seasonal flu that you get a shot for. That's what I hope we're heading for. And so far, so good. That's what it looks like it's doing. Okay. And for those of you who have had any kind of suffrage 
on behalf of COVID, please know that we are in no way minimizing, you know, this, we're coming at this from a kind of a statistical standpoint an economic right. view. Right. And so we feel the pain for sure. And I just have a client whose husband is just home from the hospital and recovering and all we're sending all the love uh, to Sonia and her husband. Definitely. I want to be, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off for Sonia and her husband. We'll, we'll offer up prayers just yes. as we do for everyone. But really, yeah. you know, I, I think everybody in this room probably knows either somebody's had the virus, you mm -hmm. may have had the virus yourself, or maybe you know someone who's passed away from the virus. Yeah. I know I've had all three in my life and, yeah. and it, it's it's horrible. Shocking. And, and, yeah, yeah. And we just, we, we want to see it reduced. We want to see this really transition away from killing so many people, so many good people have been lost into something that we can deal with on a regular basis. And that's what the hope is. Yeah. And I think that I probably think of the flu a little bit differently now because the flu yeah. kills a lot of people every year too, right? Oh yeah. 30,000, you know, uh, every year, essentially in the United States, again, a bad yeah. year was probably about 40 to 50,000, maybe 60,000, but yeah. obviously we're, we're well past that with uh, COVID and okay. uh, yeah, I mean, that's, okay. it's, it's interesting to, you know, keep those in context. Yes, exactly. Now you've been out on the road doing meetings, live events, in-person events, I should say. And so you have seen different protocols going on. Um, before, before I ask you this, uh, hey, shout out to Carol and Michael. Thank you so much for tuning in from Orange County in Vancouver. Love having you on with us. Um, you've seen different protocols for people. What, um, you know, it kind of is chunked down into, into ways that they're protecting their audiences. I, I feel like educating people on what all the meetings are doing right now is really helpful because you as a speaker can be a partner in safety with your clients and also help them, you know, calm their nerves that you know exactly what you're doing walking into a situation. So talk about some of the protocols that you've seen that you thought worked well maybe not so well, like what have you seen? Yeah, it really depends on, you know, what the conference organizer is trying to uh, achieve and what their members want. So, you know, we had, we could have a total clamp down, you know, if nobody wanted to be exposed to each other, then you'd do it all virtually, obviously. Yes. But if yeah. you do want to have people get together, there's, there's a couple of different ways you can approach it. Um, one group that I saw um, was pretty uh, stringent in what they did. They mm -hmm. required you to have a CDC issued vaccination card right. um, and that you had to show that before you could enter the conference okay. or you had to get tested 24 hours before you came in and have obviously a negative outcome on that. So that right. was pretty stringent. They also did some interesting things too, where um, the size of the audience was much smaller than what they would normally have. Yeah, we're and seeing that a lot. Yeah, and the tables were more dispersed out. So mm -hmm. that was one way of approaching it. Yeah. Another, and, and that was a much smaller group. Another group that I spoke to was much larger. It was about 500. And they had, uh, it was really interesting. They they didn't require, but they asked people if they wanted to wear masks. So you can do that. Um, obviously, you can, you can do that anywhere you want. But right. telling your audience members that, this is a good idea, um, is, is not a bad thing. You can also, they also had tables dispersed out with only about six per, you know, a table of normally like 10 people, I think it was. So right. it was pretty good dispersion there. But also what I thought was really interesting was on the lanyards for your name um, tag, they had red, yellow, and green. Yeah. So with red, it was like, don't, don't, don't come back near it up. feet, right? Back it up. We're yeah. not going to shake hands. Yeah. Um, and then yellow was some kind of mixture in between that. And yeah. then green was like full hugs and whatever you want. Bring it in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't think I would be in bring it in mode just yet. Like I'm still the, nah. so um, yeah, that's really interesting. And, and I think from a speaker perspective, you need to help be a guide to your, um, the person who's hiring you in terms of what is comfortable for you as well. Mm -hmm. Obviously, obviously you're not going to wear a mask on stage. 
Um, but they can also maybe supply you with like a handler, maybe like a COVID safety handler who can run interference for you. Maybe there's a table in between you and, you know, for books or something like that. Hey, let's sell some books while we're talking about this and like keep people just a, a little bit of a reasonable distance away from you. I like the idea of a handler, just someone to say, Hey, sorry. And that makes you not the bad person by saying, okay, um, you're in my personal space here. Right. Yeah. So. Well, I, think that's, I, I think that's a good idea. It, it does put the burden back on the conference organizer to dedicate somebody to you. I think as a speaker, I think it's really easy visually to provide cues on what you're going to do, right? If you walk, you know, you walk up that stage, you put your mask on. And if you have a lanyard that's red, it really tells people where you're coming from. Yes, so for sure. I would, yeah, I would encourage speakers to do that. It's it's more so, and this is this is how it's just so strange now in, in our world, whether you're vaccinated or not, and whether you wear a mask or not, and whether that's a political statement or not. Yes. But to me, because I have been vaccinated, I wear a mask. It's not for me, it's for you. It's to protect you because I could be asymptomatic right. and I could give people the virus who have not been either gotten the vaccination or wearing a mask. So to me, it's just, it's more to help the people that are around you to protect me as well. I, you know, shaking hands, that's, you know, obviously something that if you're going to do that, just have a bottle of, you know, yeah. stuff that you can rub on really quickly and just yeah. be very mindful of touching your face. I mean, it's just like the basic blocking and tackling that you, you know, get from the CFTC about how not to get the virus. And I will say, just because I reviewed a client's video this morning, be very aware of all of the different feelings that there might be in the audience. If you're bringing people up onto stage to be, to do things with you, yeah. you want to be, make them aware that you're aware and keep people at a distance so that if I'm in the audience and you're up like this to somebody, I'm not thinking too close, too close. You know, like everybody's got different levels of this. And I hate Andy. And I know you've been like knee deep in politics um, all along studying the economy. You've even worked at the White House before. So you have a really, you understand politics from places that other people do not. And um, I just hate how polarizing this whole thing is and that, you know, it's become something completely different than what it actually is, which is a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. And I think you need to take that in consideration when you talk to audiences and to be respectful of people's decisions that they make, because mm -hmm. there are religious reasons. There are medical yes. reasons for why people yes. have not gotten vaccination. And I, yep. I'm very supportive of that. I'm, I'm very cognizant of it. And to your point, like if you are um, a speaker who is, um, you know, going to use an audience member for something, you know, asking them, you know, just saying, Hey, are you comfortable for coming up here? I'm going to keep six feet between us. Yeah. You, know, you can wear your mask if you want. What, yeah. Like being cognizant of that and, and talking about the elephant in the room right away. Cause yes. it just puts everybody at ease. For sure. For sure. All right. Let's switch gears now over to um, marketing perspective. And while we do that, if anybody has any questions, please put them into the comments box and we'll pull you up onto the screen here, which is so fun. Um, from a marketing perspective, I have a few ideas on this as well, but should it be all systems go for the clients? Like, what are you feeling? Are you feeling some uh, meetings getting postponed and pushed back? That's the sense that I'm getting from a lot of my clients is that oh no, we have to brace ourselves because we're going back in time. And one thing that you said that was kind of heartening to me, I don't know if that's the opposite of disheartening, but you said that we will not be going back to full on lockdown. So talk a little bit about that. And then let's talk about why we don't have to freak out this second time around. Right. So let me qualify a couple of things. Um, okay. Like it really depends on the, the country. Of and yes. the state that you're in. Uh, here in the United States, Hawaii stopped all meetings, yeah. anything over 10 people, um, which was really disappointing because- <laughs> You were on your way to Hawaii. <laughs> I was on my way there. That was really unfortunate. Yeah. Um, and you can understand from their standpoint, you know, obviously small island nation, they really want to get a hold of it. But I would also say that 
we've learned so much about how to deal with the virus um, that I, I would have put it back to the people and the organizers and the members and what they're comfortable with yes. uh, as far as what they want to do. But I, I, I think we have um, we, we've taken steps to not have to go back to where we're like, oh, my gosh, we need to stop everything to get a hold of this virus and shut it down. That's not what we're going to do anymore. You can see that in the governors um, in the yes. United States. Uh, again, I'm just going to use the U.S. as reference here. Yes. But um, specifically in the southern states, they haven't done that very much. And yes, they've seen increases in vaccine or increases in outbreaks. But um, I, I, I strongly believe that um, as far as conference organizers go, it's 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 can they shift gears based off of what their members want? Um, I am speaking in front of a financial services group uh, on Monday. Okay. And they have said, look, we are very comfortable with um, where we're at with this um, and the hotel and what they have provided. We're moving forward. It's going to be about 500 people. Um, yeah. So that's an example of you know how they view their membership. They want to get together. They want to do things. Other yeah. groups are like, nope, we're full on virtual. Hey, let's do it. We need this information right now. We yeah. cannot postpone this conference. Our members need to have your insights, Andy. And so we're going to move forward with it. And then there's other people who are like, you know what? Let's go to 2022. Yeah. So, and, and, and I've my a heart, lot of dump out. Yeah. yeah sure. and, it's, and it's really tough for speakers. It's, it's really difficult for their audiences. And it's extremely difficult for the speaker bureaus because that's all they spend their time on is trying to rearrange things. Contract, and recontract, contract. Yeah. Addendum, contract, recontract. That's, a, you know, they spent all of last year redoing contracts and now they're doing it again. And I can see why people are getting like anxious, but I just want you to know that anxious is not the mindset that we can come at this from. We've been here before and they've been here before. All the businesses, Andy, they know they need to continue. They need to keep their their stuff going. And so whether they switch to virtual, bump it out, here's what I look at it like. Rather than having the thought, oh, no, have the thought, hey, maybe there's an opportunity for me to do some work with them while we're waiting for that live in-person event to happen. Okay. Yeah. Well, even more so, and this is what's really cool. Um, so you look at this as a problem that needs to be solved and all problems are opportunities, right? So mm -hmm. what, I'm, what I'm doing, and, and I advocate this to all the speakers that are out there is like, look, if they want to postpone it, totally understand that that's what they want to do. I would say initially go, look, can you do virtual? Yes. I mean, just right away. Cause most, if this isn't 2020, most of these groups have done virtuals. They probably and it turned right out away. well. Yeah. I mean, we've done it well. I mean, the salespeople want to be in person, no mm -hmm. doubt about it. Yes. But for the, for the regular associations to some extent um, that, that meet frequently, they understand how this process works. So mm -hmm. that's the first step. Then after that, you go, okay, well, if we can't do that, why don't we, why, why don't we, if we're going to go into 2022, let's, put a clause in there that says, we're going to do this in the first quarter. If not, let's do a virtual and maybe do a couple of virtuals, maybe even a yeah. series on this topic. Yeah, and so yeah. then you can expand out the, the sales process and the, and the number of uh, speeches that you do. So there's a wonderful opportunity to do more than just one event and, and spread it out. And caveat, we are not suggesting that the more is for free. They have oh, no. a budget no, no, no. and, um, you know, we're working off of a budget that is different from their, their a conference budget. And so I want you all to recognize that we're suggesting opportunity in terms of more. And, and when you've built this relationship, when you all get to the end of the day and you have the big in-person event, you're going to have an amazing relationship, which is going to continue to build from there. And I think more spinoff will come from that. Sure. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for listening in, Steve. Great and important conversation for all live events. Still uncertain times, not all the way through this yet. You're so tr you're so right about that, Steve. And thanks, Shelly. Appreciate this transparent perspective on the current landscape and outlook. You know, one of the things that we always try to come from, uh, Shelly, is... Um, a positive place. And 
Andy's been with me. He was the great calmer downer at the beginning. I call him my great calmer downer. Uh, we did podcasts together at the beginning of COVID. And of course, um, you did kind of know what was ahead of us. And when people said to me like two years or three years, it was unfathomable. And the reason it was, was because we couldn't go back to 2020 in March and what happened and see our entire industry wipe out. Mm -hmm. But the reason I'm feeling so much more confident this time around is number one, I've checked my mindset and I'm on track for opportunity versus fear. And also we know what we're doing now. And as you have said, we're not going necessarily into full on lockdown, which is incredible. And, um, now maybe we will see that, you know, in some states, right? What are they going to do in Florida to get things under control? Well, it's a great question, but certainly uh, the governor there who um, maintained Florida being open uh, during 2020 to some extent um, yeah. after the federal government shut it down, um, you, you know what their mindset is. Um, they obviously tourism is so important for Florida, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, as it is for the EU. You know, interestingly to note that they opened up travel from the United States for non-essential for all of the summer. And then once the summer was over, they said, you know, each state should review this now and maybe not have non-essential travel happen. I mean, it just yeah. the timing of it. Well, we really opened up. Indicative. We opened up to you all. And I wish I'm in Canada, by the way, everybody. And I would like, like, no, uh, I've seen the numbers. Don't let them in. So sorry. I apologize for I, that's what we do in Canada. We say sorry. But, um, you know, so here's a, just a great kind of parallel. Our association, the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers, also known as CAPS, we already made our conference virtual in December of coming up, like in the next four months, in December, we will be virtual. That decision was made five, six months ago. NSA already had a convention middle of summer, July in, in uh, Vegas, and came away with, I think, um, over 20 cases of COVID during the conference. And what I'm showing you is just the parallels in terms of, you know, I think we're just a far more conservative country and we are also a much more compliant country. Andy, I wouldn't be surprised and maybe, you know, the number, if we get to like 85% uh, double vaxxed, do you have any idea? I don't know what our number is right now, but anyway, we're on our way. Canada is, but I know the United States, obviously, with the Delta outbreak uh, and the Delta variant, I should say, the vaccination numbers are going up significantly across the globe when it's available. Um, I'm sure Canada, Canada is a much smaller country. It's about um, a tenth of the size population of the United yes. States. So yes. um, you have to kind of keep that in perspective. You mm -hmm. can do things with that size of a population that you can't do with the larger population. Um, so it's it's a little bit easier, but still, I think it's also indicative of the way that you know many uh, of those in Canada approach COVID, yeah. uh, as opposed in the United States. So it's just it's a different mindset, not and, nearly well, as political either. Well, yeah. th right, and but I also think it's it's just um, when you're looking at conferences, it's really clearly it's driven by the members. So CAPS is going to have a different mindset. CAPS has probably pulled everybody and said, you know, do you want to come or not? And everybody said, no, let's do virtual. That's great. Do it mm -hmm. that way. Other groups um, here in the States, other associations, different sectors want to get together. They're, they're willing to take the risk or understand yeah. the risk that they're, they're comfortable with it. So it's just, you know, it's just kind of a different way of approaching it. Hey, if you guys have questions, I would love to hear them now. We're going to be wrapping up in about five to 10 minutes. So bring on the questions about what's coming. We have a really smart economist with us. We need to take advantage. Here's my question to you. When it comes to the economy, you study the economy day in, day out, and you go out and tell different sectors what to expect. You tell agriculture, here's what's coming down the pike for you guys. You tell financial services, here's what's coming down the pike for you guys. Talk about the speaking industry and what you see coming based on what you know. Well, first and foremost, um, 
it, it it's and the speaking business is driven by demand and you know one of the strongest demands that we see out there and again i'm speaking from an association standpoint but um you know it's industry meetings that's just so driven by um the the sales teams they want to physically be there they want to physically interact with the potential clients that are out there so you know, we've kept that under wraps. We open, you know, in 2020, we opened it back up to some extent in 2021. You know, some of this process is, as we've already discussed, is is evolving. Um, some of the things that I have in the fall have some of them have gone virtual, some have not. We kind of talked about that. But mm -hmm. to me, as far as the demand goes, it's getting more and more pent up. So I know demand is so strong. And, and Jimmy, it's like, I don't know when the last time you've been to a face-to-face -face meeting, but mm. the joy that is in that audience is palpable. <laughs> I mean, it's so strong. People are just like, like overjoyed to be there. It's so great. So yeah. I, I think while this is put off for a while um, to the full onset of having full conferences, I think the demand is going to continue to build and build and build. So people need this information. People need information on leadership, on sales, on the economy, on you name it. They, they have to get that information out. So I think the demand will continue to be very, very strong. Um, and, and, and I don't think we're going to see it. It has changed and it has shifted just as work has shifted. Mm -hmm. right, to an extent where we're not all going to, Everyone's not going to go back into the office. It'll be a hybrid model. That I think is exactly where the industry is going. It's you're yeah. going to offer it. You're going to offer it to stay at home or you're going to offer it to come and be part of a meeting. Yeah. So that's ultimately where I think we're going to end up. My prediction is that people will do hybrid meetings separately from conferences rather than, sorry, let me say that again. People will do virtual meetings separately from in-person conferences, because I think we recognize that the people at home can often feel left out. I wrote an article on LinkedIn uh, earlier this year about why you need a host for both the virtual event and the in-person event, because they are really different beasts. I mean, a telephone, a, a television production has like the live audience is doing one thing and they're really building it for the viewers at home because it's TV. So recognizing that a lot of people have not done the virtual audiences well enough, I don't think. And therefore, what I think might happen is that they separate them out and do little top ups in between. Vir uh, we call them virtual power ups at um, the, the coaching company, Strategic Coach, where I go, and they're fantastic. So I'll go in person, but then I'll also have a virtual power up session to attend in between. Um, would you say that you might see that coming? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different ways um, that you can enhance the virtual experience. But I think what you hit upon there is so important because it's engagement. That's what clients who hire you want. They want you to engage the audience, whether that's in person or whether it's virtual. And there's ways to do that, right? There's things like polling. Everybody knows this, right? There's ways of asking the question. There's ways of getting people to interact with you because what you're trying to do is, is engage the audience, get them to participate and don't keep them at that you know television show kind of feel where they're just sitting back eating popcorn and not really paying attention to the content right. that's being delivered. So that's engagement. Things. Yeah. Um, and as a presenter, then you need to understand that I I've done full blown recorded, um, green screen, virtual, uh, talks, which are really cool to do. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really fun. My, my highlight reel has that, but nice. then what's important after that, I think is just as important is then to do exactly what you say, have a moderator, to curate the questions and then have you do Q and a and talk about things that have gone on since yeah. you recorded the virtual. So yeah. and give them some special attention for the people yeah. at home. That's, yeah, that's definitely. really the point. I mean, maybe people will get better and better at doing it, but um, well, just real quickly, one other thing too, if you're doing a hybrid event, know you're doing a hybrid event. Don't yeah. just like, I've seen it like 
whether it's preachers in churches or presenters, I've seen them do very similar things, which is they get so excited to be in front of an audience. All they do is look down at the audience and they forget that that little dot right in yeah. front of them is the most important thing that you have to talk to because those are the people that are at home. And there's a lot of things you can do. You got to bring a lot of energy. You got to bring a lot of engagement. There's a lot of things you got to do, but you got to be aware of the dots. So that's what I had asked people to do as well. Carol has this question that's kind of pertinent, and I'm going to come down back to the hospitality question. Any research on what audiences think, i.e. Um, what kind of engagement really works? And we've seen so many things during uh, all of this entire time period where we've all gone to Zoom. One thing that I know that works, Carol, is making sure that you don't forget about the people who are at home and listening and get that chat box hopping like the minute you get on your webinar or whatever it is that you're doing, make sure that they feel engaged and look at your timing. Oh, I let them rest there for 25 minutes. That might be too long. So Andy, what else have you got for? Her? Yeah, it really depends on the size of the audience because <clears throat> if you're doing like, for instance, when I do board of directors meetings, you know, generally I like to have the 12 people that are there so I can see them. And if I have a small meeting like that, I, I'm doing my presenting, but I'm looking at their reactions. Yes. And so some, sometimes it's just as subtle as somebody kind of going like this. And mm -hmm. you go, hey, Bob, I saw you're nodding your head. Did you want to say something or yeah. did I with you? So you exactly. can engage in that way. And it's really I fun to do. Watch that unmute button. So make it really cool for somebody to unmute at any time they want to speak up and really watch. And, you know, I have sidekicks on most everything that I do. And it's like, oh, Jen, you wanted to weigh in on that. Go ahead. You know, I can just tell because she unmuted herself. That means she's got something to say. And so there's that's just so little but it may not be something that's front and center for people. Um, thank you, Anders. Uh, look your audience in the eye, which means through the little tiny lens. I've got on order a Kickstarter campaign for a middle of the screen camera. So it's going to hang down and it's going to be right where your picture is on my screen, Andy. And I'm so excited to get it, but I haven't gotten it yet. So I don't know what round I am in the Kickstarter. Let me go back to this hospitality question from Shelly. The industry where I really enjoy serving is hospitality. We all know what's happened there. I'd like to know your thoughts on hospitality landscape. Thank you. Great questions. Yeah. And I think that's really the the, the truly devastated sector, obviously, as everybody know, leisure and hospitality, um, yes. they lost the most jobs. Um, they have struggled due to the um, reopening then reshutting down, reopening all the different protocols that were put in place to make bars and restaurants and conferences um, safe uh, that, you know, those are significant costs. And then the 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 real struggle, and again, I'm sorry, I'm just going to keep this to the United States, but we have almost 11 million job openings here in the United States, and most of it's in, in leisure and hospitality and retail. So the cost of hiring those people is going up significantly. You, mm -hmm. you know, those job openings are there. People say, oh, I can't hire somebody. That's not true. You can't hire people at the price point that you're offering right now. Right, you have right. to increase that. So I, I think that's the struggle right now. And certainly uh, as we head into the fall and into the winter, I, th I think there was a question about the winter coming up, about mm -hmm. what that would look like. But that's last year, that's when we had our biggest spike in infections when everybody moved yeah. inside. Right. So that's a concern as well. Um, but I think for that industry in particular, we're going to see wage increases uh, to get the workers to come back to work. Um, here in the United States, we've had some um, uh, un extended unemployment benefits that ended this week. Okay. Uh, that I think we'll also, uh, we'll will also be the Yeah. Of people going back to work once those benefits have ended. Not I'm not trying to be a curmudgeon and say it's right or wrong. It's just this is the way it is. And this right. is what we would expect. And so the industry itself, like maybe it's built on confidence of people traveling. So they just had Labor Day numbers. I'm sure the Labor Day numbers in terms of traveler wasn't anything like normal. So as we continue to fight this, um, perhaps the confidence in traveling will get better and better. I'm sure you've been in hotel. I have not been in a hotel 
since the second week of March, 2020. And I'm up here in Canada in my little bubble. I don't think I'm going to travel like at all this year. And I'm okay with that. Like, this is my business. I do it online anyway. So it's not a big deal for me, but. I I will tell you as somebody who's traveled, the hotels are super clean. They have to be, they have to provide, you know, it's a great example of them providing the, the comfort to the people that do come there. Um, for them to come in and show up and feel safe. They're awesome. Um, they're really good. And, and, they, and, and I've not felt uncomfortable wherever I've traveled. Um, and I've been to a bunch of different places recently. So yeah. whether it's Washington, D.C., Orlando, or Kansas City, or wherever, uh, they're all making strong efforts. So people should feel good about that. The key to this thing is everybody getting vaccinated. I, and I know that's a little bit controversial, but you're going to see these rates continue to go higher and higher. Canada is a great example. But we're going to see it in EU in the United States, but it's got to be a global effort. Yeah, We really won't get to some extent what we would call herd immunity, which is I'm sure everybody's heard, but it, it's where you're reducing the, the set of people that are most susceptible to the virus. I right. think in the United States, 90% of the people, um, Think, I think I've got the number right. Over the age of 65, have been vaccinated, and oh, that's, that's really you know significant. That's um, good. So that's it's great news. So I think I think people are going to continue to want to travel. They 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 are very desirable of that. Um, so I think that's going to continue to go up. We'll see some numbers come off from where they were this summer, uh, obviously, but because of the Delta and also heading into the fall. But overall. We're in the process of figuring this out more than clearly than where we were last year. Right, right. And the students coming back, that's a hump. This is the hump that we need to get over is these students coming back. Um, Steve's asking, how do you convince conference event coordinators uh, they need to make their speakers and presentations much snappier and shorter for virtual? Uh, key from what I have found, how do you balance that if the conference event is a hybrid? And so, um, you know, Steve, you got to sell it, man. You just, uh, if you know of a way that is going to make their conference really rock, then say, Hey, listen, I've attended these conferences, show them some research. And this is what they found. Use the old feel felt found, uh, you know, my, my conference coordinators used to feel like they had to do this length of session, but what they found when they shortened it up was that they got better results, blah, blah, blah. So sell it. That's what I would do. What about, what do you think, Andy? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, my experience with this is I'm iterative, right? So I try a lot of different things. Yes. Uh, sometimes it's, it's like if the block is 30 minutes and that's all they want you for, then that's what you got to do. If they give you like some of the clients have said, I want you to talk for an hour and a half. And I'm like, you're, you're kidding. Yeah. So long a time. <laughs> no one, no economics, one. economics for 90 minutes. No, <laughs> but Andy is so the best economist like, speaker out there, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> nobody wants that. So, it, and I'm really good, but even still, um, <laughs> the biggest is like, what you're trying to do is make it entertaining and informative And so what you have to say is, look, my experience has been, you know, the best virtual experience is 30 minutes of content, 15 minutes of Q&A. And really what you can just do is say, look, however long you want me to, you know, answer questions, that is up to you. But I'll do 30, maybe 35 minutes of of content, and then we'll open it up for discussion. And it just depends on what slot you're in and, you know, whether you're before break or after break or however they're doing it. Um, allows that to you. But just a quick story, like first time I, 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 somebody asked me to narrow it down to like 20 minutes. Now I've got a lot of content that I need to convey as I do my, where we've been, where we are and where we're going for the economy. Yeah. So I was like, rah, you know, like, <laughs> talking really, really fast. And then we opened it up for questions and it was like, <laughs> no man, question it was so Good. much a short period of time. They were asking that to me because they hired me for about four events. So then they said, Hey, you know, that was a little too much too fast. So I was like, got it. Yeah. Next one, slowed it down, spaced it out, gave the audience a chance to breathe. You know, it's those things that you learn after you yeah. do it. And, and remember that they don't know what they're missing. You know, Andy, what they're missing, but they don't know. And so I would just say, you know, less is always more, especially when they're asking for that. Hey, anybody wants to get in touch with um, Andy Bush, go to andrewbush.com. 
And I want to just say, if anybody needs help, I'm getting feedback. This happened the last time. Um, if anybody needs help with their COVID strategy, drop me a line over email. I've got a session that is like a sample uh, coaching session that we could do together. And I really have um, some very, very strong ideas on what to do during this next round of uh, COVID. So uh, what final thoughts would you like to leave us with as we wrap up uh, COVID variant in the speaking industry today on LinkedIn Live? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's like, these are kind of cliches, but really look at these problems as opportunities. Um, I kind of walk you through how you can extend and actually book more gigs if, if, you're, if you work with the client to help them understand what's available to them as far as you know, uh, options. So don't get dismayed. I, I know I do too. So I'd feel for you um, when a client cancels or when they extend oh, it another year. It, to me, it's like, just remind you, I just keep telling myself, all right, here's an opportunity. Let's figure out if I can do two or three instead of just the one. So that's what I would say with COVID. It's, it, you know, it's going to evolve even more. We're going to get way better at dealing with it. We're going to get more people vaccinated. The pool of people that are going to be severely infected is going to drop significantly over the next year. So keep that in mind. There are ways of dealing with this and you can keep your speaking business going and keep it vibrant. I, I think that's what's exciting about these times. Yeah, for sure. I see. I'm so happy that your mindset is shifted over to opportunity. Have your, your COVID package ready. I mean, this really truly is you know, you could have a smorgasbord of options to say, okay, you know, we've got this issue. We've got this problem. Be their partner in solving the problem rather than someone who's coming from an, oh no, fear-based standpoint and just be ready with like a, a few menu items that you can say, all right, well, ha you know, obviously you are hiring me to help solve a problem. What can we do in the meantime? Here are four or five choices Love that. Love that you're thinking about um, opportunity. Andrew Bush, thank you so much for taking the time out of your crazy busy schedule to be here with us on uh, The Wealthy Speaker on LinkedIn Live today. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, where do you best connect? Do you connect best on LinkedIn or um, any social media platform? Yeah. So I, I mean, that's where I live is in LinkedIn um, okay. where my clients are. So you can reach yes. me there or you can uh, reach me through andrewbush.com. Uh, either awesome. one of those is, is great. So uh, please feel free to you know request a LinkedIn uh, a connection and uh, we'll, we'll go from and, there. And say that you saw it on the Wealthy Speaker Show so exactly. that he knows where you have come from. Exactly. And thank you all for joining us. I appreciate everybody who's been in the house. We've had Carol and uh, Anders and Steve and uh, Shelly and Gloria and Mike. Thank you so much, James. Uh, really appreciate you all tuning in with us today. And with that, we will say see you soon, Wealthy Speakers. Bye for now, everyone.